Wait, remember the life and times of Juniper Lee? Well, I sure do. I, for some reason, thought it was called Jupiter Lee back when it first came out, but I later found out that's my brain's fault. The life and times of Juniper Lee was a Cartoon Network original series that kicked its way onto TV in May of 2005. Following Juniper on her witty comebacks as she is the ancient magical protector of the mythical and mundane, as she is chosen to be the next Tushwanze. Hmm, that kind of sounds familiar. Nah, 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 completely different. Anyway, Juniper is an 11-year-old Chinese American preteen who lives in a fictionalized version of San Francisco, Orchid Bay City, a hot spot for these magical and mysterious creatures. Hmm, a Chinese American kid who is a chosen protector to mythical creatures living in an American city that released in 2005 with a dog that looks like this. Nah, nah, nah. Well, let's focus on that later. Today, I wanted to take a look back at the life and times of Juniper Lee, another Cartoon Network based video. Look, I'm just trying to balance out this to my Nickelodeon output, plus, I have a lot more JetX coming, which is technically just more Disney. Anyway, play the intro. Juniper Lee, the insult-slinging, mythical protecting, butt-kicking heroine from the Bay Area. Juniper is the definition of cool and fashion. That colorful hair streak, who else is rocking that? Okay, yeah, well, yeah, whatever, dude. Juniper Lee is 11 years old and is now the current Tushwanze to keep peace and balance in the world hidden under the noses of humans thanks to the veil, a mystical yet thinly delicate force that hides magic from human eyes. Juniper, though, is able to see through the veil because of her abilities, which also include enhanced speed, strength, agility, reflexes, and she can conjure up and cast spells, you know, just because she needed a little bit more magic sprinkled in. But that's only scratching the surface. The show itself is predominantly episodic, spending its runtime focusing mainly on Juniper's training for her chosen duties, fighting any magical or mystical threat that pops up, and of course, dealing with her human day-to-day -day life. It's a lot to ask of someone. Using folklore from all over the world, the show brings in a rotating cast of interesting villains, like Sandman, the king of the realm of slumber, and also his real name is Steve. Steven? Yeah, whatever. Skeeter, not the nose honkin' blue variety, but more of the mummy businessman variety. Heck, even Loki is here, a literal Norse god. I love a show with a cool cast of interesting villains, and this show definitely checks that box off easily. Juniper at first is initially daunted by the responsibilities that come with being the Tushwanzi, but thanks to her given protective role, she is unable to leave Orchid Bay City until another family member is chosen to take her place. Helping Juniper deal with everything her title entails is her grandmother Jasmine Lee, or Ama, who is also often referred to as the greatest Tushwanze to ever take up the mantle. She's a highly skilled fighter who tries her best to pass off the wisdom she has onto Juniper and aid in her duties. She also has a streak of color in her hair, which comes from the powers when you first inherit them. Also teaching Juniper is Monroe, or properly put, Monroe Connery Boyd Carlisle McGregor Scott V, a centuries-old talking Scottish pug whose destiny is to work in aiding every Tushwanze. So due to that, his wisdom and knowledge of the magical world comes as a major help to Juniper. Juniper. Juniper also has a brother who sometimes joins her on her adventures around the city. His name is Ray Ray, he's eight years old, he's magicless, and he's hyperactive. But thanks to an incident where he was in the way when Juniper was getting her newly given power drained in the Adventures of Babysitting episode, he ended up getting a bit of the powers himself in ways of now being able to see through the veil with Juniper, so no longer are the monsters hidden from him. Their relationship is built on two core fundamentals. The first being a sibling rivalry, but at the end of the day, the second is that they deeply care for one another. And they make a nice tag team duo sometimes. They also have an older brother named Dennis. Oop. Sorry, that's wrong photo. This is Dennis. He is a grumpy, moody 15-year-old who acts very dismissively towards his younger siblings, at least at the beginning of the series. Throughout the show, we do see this relationship improve. Juniper's parents, Michael and Barbara, kind of hold in their hands the stress and balance of Juniper's social and academic life. Michael was originally supposed to take on the mantle of Tushwanze after Ama, but that trait skipped him and ended up passing right to Juniper instead. Kind of like the mom in American Dragon, Jake Long, I'm, I'm sorry, still getting ahead of myself with that. Barbara, on the other hand, is a good mom. She wants the best for her kids, but will not allow any problems to get in the way of their education. <laughs> Now going on to Juniper's non-magical side of her life. Her best friends are Jody Irwin, Ophelia Ramirez, and Roger Radcliffe. They aid her in her toughest fight of all, surviving middle school. I'm Ned and this is my survival guide. 
Jody is a bit of a quirky girl and Juniper's immediate closest friend who is always there for her. Ophelia, in comparison to Jody, is a melodramatic goth girl that has a tendency to be a, a bit of a perfectionist, if you will. Roger, on the other hand, well, he's the class clown who totally has a major crush on Ophelia. Like, look, dude, I get it. Goth girls ruined me too. But Ophelia doesn't reciprocate those feelings. And we all can't forget Marcus Connor, the person Juniper has a major crush on, but you won't catch her admitting to it. He's a more popular kid, but is pretty much friends with everyone and always has an eye out for Juniper. A very chill dude who gives off very good vibes. He also has a crush on Juniper back, but like her, was also too afraid to admit it. Maybe they can go to a dance together. Melissa O'Malley is Juniper's school rival who also likes Marcus, but more for the reasons of Juniper not having a chance. Essentially, if it's in favor of Juniper being one-upped, well, she's in. Now, some monsters make multiple appearances as friends to Juniper and Ray Ray like Cletus, Gus, and Leela. A fun cast of interesting creatures to be a part of several storylines. Also, Ray Ray likes Leela. Hey, I ain't judging. But like I said earlier, the villains also steal the show here as well. Some with really awesome designs with cool villain arcs and some that just don't have either of those things. There's the Humans Against Magic or HAM for short. Their goal is to cleanse the earth of magic. They aren't fans of magic. They want all magic to be destroyed. Did you hear they don't like magic? Lex is the leader of HAM. Auntie Rune, a 400 year old witch whose power level makes all humans, magical creatures, and Vegeta tremble. Everyone look, Rainbow Fish is back. Even Avatar Marge Simpson is here. Oh, never mind. That's just demoness. She mainly wants to free her dad, the banished Kordoth. Kai, a former Tushwanze that went rogue and was brought back to current day time. And of course, there's monsters and creatures galore. And you can't forget about this Alolan Raticate looking thing. I will say though, Sandman overall is pretty slick. He's also voiced by Cosmo himself. Lucky me. Then there's Jonathan, a TV show producer. Yep, there he is. The amount of cool characters they would interchange for the threat of the week was always pretty fun to see. Whether it was a returning villain or a one-off character, the show had a good blend of character design and ideas to play with without having villains feel like a copy and paste of one another. But that's just the fun within the show. Let's take a look into how Juniper Lee came to be. Judd Winnick, a jack of all trades when it comes to being a cartoonist, a comic book writer, and a screenwriter, is the creator of the life and times of Juniper Lee, and also was a former reality TV personality for MTV's The Real World San Francisco. Growing up in Long Island, New York, which is where he found his love for cartoons and comic books, he decided that going to school for it was the right career path for him, now attending the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Art. After graduation is when he applied to be a contestant on The Real World San Francisco in hopes that it would be something that could help his career in some shape or form. Now living in San Francisco, his time there truly influenced him in his work. Fully now inspired to design Juniper Lee's city in the show, Orchard Bay, around that. Before Juniper Lee though, Judd was able to achieve some of his dreams in comics, being involved in writing for DC properties such as Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and Batman, with Under the Hood both being the comic and then the animated film Under the Red Hood. For coming up with Juniper Lee, he has been quoted saying that he had pulled inspiration from shows like The Simpsons and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, specifically Buffy pushing a strong influence in coming up with Juniper herself, as in the show they follow a similar path as Buffy, all being made in-house at Cartoon Network's Burbank studio with Rough Drafts Korea aiding in the animation from overseas, the show would premiere on Cartoon Network on May 30th, 2005, spanning three seasons for a total of 40 episodes and six shorts, coming to an end on April 9th, 2007. Now, while the show would be on broadcast in a 4-3 ratio, the series would be produced in a widescreen 16-9 ratio and in high definition, making it the first Cartoon Network original show to do so. Judd would later go on to still work on DC-related properties and his original passion, comic books, as well as wrote for the animated superhero comedy from Seth Meyers, The Awesomes, and Hilo, a concept of something that he came up with so that his seven-year-old son could read at the time. While there isn't much to note about the production side of the show, it's clear to see that the show did hit a nice mark on the network, getting support from the fans watching it and even winning a primetime Emmy in 2006 and an Annie Award in 2007. There's only one thing that truly gave this show a hard time, and that is all the comparisons to another network's show, American Dragon Jake Long. Now, you and I, sure, we can make our jokes throughout this video, it's all fun and games, no disrespect or shade thrown anywhere, but these shows were very close in so many ways that you wouldn't be vilified for pointing out just how weirdly similar they are. Now what?
First and foremost, both shows' premises were very close. Obviously, Jake can transform into a dragon, but the whole Chosen One being a protector of the mythical thing within a major US city didn't help any arguments to split the difference between the two. On top of that, both main protagonists, Juniper and Jake, are both Chinese-American kids with a knack for laying down some smack talk to their adversaries. And their names both start with J. I mean, even look at the dogs in this show. Do we even have to point that out? Now, I know they are different breeds. In Monroe, Connery, Boyd, Carlisle, McGregor, Scott the Fifth here is Scottish. But come on! The other issue being that these two shows premiered in the same year, less than half a year apart. Juniper Lee, like I mentioned, premiered at the end of May in 2005. American Dragon Jake Long, however, premiered in mid-late January of 2005. Even though that show lasted only two seasons, it had more episodes and it ran a little bit longer than Juniper Lee did, also ending in 2007. Just in September of that year versus April of 2007 for Juniper Lee. I have heard a fair amount of people refer to this show is Cartoon Network's American Dragon, but beyond those similarities, I still think that this stands on its own. It always boils down to the characters, their uniqueness, and how their stories play out, which I think this show nails in terms of that. The overall reception was largely positive, in fact, so positive that the show was set to keep going as seasons 4 and 5 were slated for production, which is what made it more surprising when the show was all of a sudden cancelled without reason, ending with a season 3 cliffhanger to be unanswered. Now, most shows can kind of just end for a whole list of reasons, but to have more ready for production and just pull it last second is a bit odd. We do know that the next era of Cartoon Network was on the horizon, but a lot of those changes wouldn't start to be made until 2008, a full year after the show had already ended. There is a passionate fan base of this show who are still fighting to see this show make a comeback and continue forward. This change.org petition, which always worked, wants the show to come back to the Cartoon Network channel or Netflix or HBO Max for the owed two seasons the show never got, with over 1,800 signatures. But in all seriousness, I love the passion here from the fans, and I would love to see this show get at least a chance to wrap things up for the fans. And who knows, it could just be as big of a hit now as it was back then. The life and times of Juniper Lee didn't just end on the small screen, however. It did branch out into other forms of media as well. From 2006 to 2012, Cartoon Network through DC published a series of comic books titled Cartoon Network Action Pack, a variety of adaptations from the network work that would be placed as multiple story anthologies. They also had a more comedy-focused series of comics titled Cartoon Network Block Party that lasted from 2004 to 2009, but for the action pack, that one clearly focused on more action-based properties, which Juniper Lee was featured alongside all of the other major shows to smaller, not-so-longer-lasting shows that all appear in the comics. Hey, good to see Mega's XLR here. Video game-wise, well, th nothing really to speak about beyond the usual website games. Monster mayhem where you take on monsters throughout the city and protect your friends from being attacked, Party Interrupted, a side-scrolling, ride-based, light platformer with some boss fights thrown in for good measure, and Out of Charm, a traditional side-scrolling platformer in beat-em-up. Oh, and she was in Cartoon Network's Fusion Fall. Who the heck is that? Man, Fusion Fall was such a, a weird... Thing. Look at poor Eddie here in the game. Ugh, 2009, what a, what a weird year. As far as other TV-related outings, Juniper Lee did appear in the truly iconic CN City bumpers that I myself and many of you out there absolutely love. These bumpers solidified a period in time for the network, making this era one of the most memorable. Juniper Lee also made a cameo with almost all of the other famous Cartoon Network characters throughout the network's history during OKKO's OK Let's Be Heroes crossover Nexus event. But maybe we can see some something further come from the series in the future, as streaming services have become the new defining medium. It would be nice to see some investment in righting some incidental wrongs and giving fans a place to come back and show their support. So many cartoons are coming back with continuations, reboots, reimaginings. Why not give Juniper Lee a fighting chance to balance things out in the world of the mystical and mundane? I personally found the show to be just as enjoyable as I did with my experience with American Dragon Jake Long. I even think the dialogue here here with the smack talk may come off a bit more natural versus Jake Long. While I do think it had a more interesting story arc, Juniper Lee stands tall as its own thing even when being in comparison. I would love to explore this world more and see where the original story was meant to fully lead to. If you like American Dragon Jake Long at all, chances are you'll probably enjoy this show as well. It brings the action and it brings the humor. As well as the visuals are great too. The color palette the show uses pops very nicely, especially in the HD version. And also, 
as a huge Spyro fan. I've made a, 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 a shut up, we don't talk about those days anymore. This show holds a special weird little place in my heart because the composer is none other than Stuart Copeland, drummer of the band The Police, using his signature sound literally sounding like the Spyro music. Bum, ba -da -dum, bum, bum, ba -da -dum, bum. Oh, it works so good. And the Amanda Show music. Three people probably found that as cool as I do. But whatever, killer music and killer theme song. If you are a fan of the life and times of Juniper Lee, let me know in the comments below. And also, do you want to see more of the show to get the rest of the story, or is three seasons the perfect amount for you? Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.